All right, hello, welcome back. I still don't have a better document camera, so you're still dealing with this. Uh, so what, uh, what are we looking at today? 5.1, start chapter five. You're gonna find this is actually a really short section of notes um, and the homework, uh, not bad. So 5.1, randomness, probability, and simulation. We gotta first define what the heck, what does this word probability mean? Um, probability, that's a long run relative frequency. Outcome of a chance process, chance process. Okay, it's a number between zero and one. We write, might write that as uh, all probabilities on the interval, zero to one inclusive. Um, this describes the proportion of times the outcome would occur in a very long series of repetitions after many trials, uh, after a long time. Um, we're gonna talk about probability. Is a forty percent chance of something? A forty percent chance it rains tomorrow. What the hell does that mean? It means that given these conditions that we see, we would, you know, and our simulations and our knowledge of physics and atmospheric particle and all this business, forty percent of times, given these initial conditions, we see it rain tomorrow. It's not saying that, you know, like there's somebody up upstairs rolling, rolling a large die saying, well, if this comes out, it's going to, no, it's, it's, given these conditions, it's going to happen this often if we do it a bunch of times. So uh, the idea here is when we're talking about probability, we need to emphasize that this is a long run thing. It's this class project of the long run. If I'd had you in person, you'd sit there and you'd flip a coin. Take a moment to just flip a coin like 10 times or something. And what might you see? Well, I, I suspect that if you flip a coin a few times, you might see, oh, well, maybe you get a bunch of heads in a row. And it's like heads, oh, shoot, heads. You get three heads in a row, and all of a sudden you say, my coin's broken. Uh, but then, oh, you get a tails, and it, maybe you got tails, and it's like, oh, well, now it's, now it's three quarters, and you get a tails again. And, oh, now it's, now it's five, five three-fifths, and, you, you know, what, what are you going to see? And, oh, maybe it's... Maybe it's even, and then it goes down, and then it goes up. And what do, what do we expect to see here? I would expect to see, as you flip a coin over and over, what do I expect that to get closer and closer to? I expect that to approach asymptotically uh, that probability 0.5. What do I, as we increase the number of flips, I suspect that the proportion of heads uh, will approach. 0.5 as the number of flips goes to infinity. Um, what do you think the proportion of heads will be in the long run? 0.5. I think it's going to asymptotically, I don't know if I spelled that right. There might be an extra taut in there. Uh, asymptotically approaches. It doesn't ever quite get there. Right? It's probably never going to get to exactly 0.5. If I flip a coin a million times, am I going to get exactly 500,000 heads? I'd be a little weirded out personally. It's like it came out perfect. That's not how this works. It's not like there, it, it's not a, there's not a little memory bank in the coin saying, oh, I got a head. It's got to come up tails next time. Coin, don't remember. Uh, on the next page, I, uh, you know, you might look at the completed notes and say, oh, this is very different. And you got this just mess of numbers. What, what is going on here? There's a guy, uh, John Edmund Carich. He's a, he's a statistician. Uh, he had a lot of time on his hands after he got stuck in a Nazi internment camp in Denmark. And so what does a statistician do? He sits around and he flips coins. What have you got here? You have got the results from this guy flipping coins over and over m is the, n is the number he's actually spinning the coin uh, m is the number of heads so what happens you know we've got a proportion as the number of flips goes up what do we see this proportion of heads doing my it's getting awfully close and kind of oscillating around 50% that's 10, 1,000 flips of the coin done 10 different times. This guy sat around flipping a coin, spinning a coin 10,000 times to record it for you to let you know that, yeah, coins are actually 50-50 shot. Because you never sat and did this experiment. He did. Uh, found that in the long run, the proportion of heads, it does indeed approach 0.5. 0.502, 5.11, a little bit below, a little bit above, a little bit above, a little bit below, a little bit above, a little. That's what we expect. 
a little bit above, a little bit below. It's around there, but it's not always exactly 50% because the coin doesn't sit there and say, oh, I got a head next time. I got to get a tail next. No, that's not how this works. Uh, it approaches it in the long run. So uh, just a, a visual example of a guy sitting and literally flipping a coin 10,000 times. According to the Book of Odds, the probability that a randomly selected U.S. adult eats breakfast is 0.61. What does that mean? That means, uh, you know, after asking many U.S. adults, I expect the proportion to approach uh, uh, 0.61. Do you expect? Now, here's a, a second follow-up question: Would you be surprised if 62 people said they? You said, you know, if you ask 100. Would you be surprised if 62 people said they ate breakfast? No, there's going to be some natural variability. Think about that. If you ask 100 people, you probably won't get exactly 61. They'll probably be like 64. Or maybe you had I don't know, 62 or you know, there's a 58. And a really hungry group, 50. You know, there's going to be some variability around it. But in the long run, that proportion should approach uh, 61%, just as it did with the coin flipping up here. You know, it's, oh, my God, look at it. He must have been thinking this coin was broken. After four flips, it only came up heads once. And he's got a 25% heads coin. Man, he must have been thinking, I got a busted coin. Oh, we're looking over here. Oh, it's, oh, my God. You know, so in the long run, after many trials, a um, few more definitions for you. Again, this is going to be a quick section of notes. Independent events. We'll talk more about independent events later with uh, probabilistic formulas. Uh, but two events are independent if the occurrence of one does not change the probability that the other will happen. Uh, in symbols, we're going to write that as the probability of A given B is the probability of A. And the probability of B given A equals the probability of B. You don't even know what that given symbol means yet. Maybe you do. Maybe you've seen conditionals. You have, in fact. Maybe you can figure out what those mean. The idea is that this B thing happening doesn't affect the chance of A happening. And this A thing happening doesn't affect the chance of B thing happening. They are independent. One thing has nothing to do with the other. Never the two shall meet or something. All right. So we have independent events. Why am I talking about independent events? Because oftentimes you're going to hear something about the law of average. Oh, he's due for a hit. He's 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 got hitless in the last ten at bats. He's due. No, he's always due for anything. Uh, if events are independent, then one occurring doesn't affect the next occurrence. Couple had five girls in a row. He's due for a boy, right? No. Uh, how likely are they to get a boy on a next pregnancy? Fifty uh, percent. You know. Nobody's, nobody's counting them up, saying, oh, you've had all your girls. Boy time. No. Uh, you flipped heads 10 times in a row. What's the probability of flipping heads in the 11th flip? One half. That coin doesn't remember. The coin has no memory. That's a memoryless system. You might talk about memoryless systems. I, they don't. They don't remember. The coin doesn't remember. The plinko board doesn't remember. The big wheel on the Price is Right doesn't remember. Don't you want to spin that wheel? It doesn't remember. Uh, so we can we can talk about these memoryless systems. People are going to talk about the law of averages. Oh, I've been been betting red all night. It's been coming up black. It's due for red. No, it's not. It's random. It's independent. So sometimes we want to know about these big processes. Maybe we want to flip a coin a bunch of times. We don't actually want to flip a coin. Or we want to know how we're going to people vote, but we don't actually make the people go out and vote. Or we want to know who's going to win the NBA finals. We don't go out and like make the guys play the NBA finals before we have the NBA finals. We just have them play. But sometimes we might want to make predictions about what's going to happen beforehand, and we can use simulations to do that. Simulations are nice. It's an imitation of a chance behavior. Uh, it's nice it ref if it re accurately reflects the si situation. It's called the simulation. And we're going to have a little four-step process here. This is our first four-step process uh, for making a simulation. 
Uh, and we're not going to do a ton of these, uh, but they will show up. And it's very important to know the, the, the ideas of a simulation. It's similar to the ideas of a, of a sampling method. We're going to use a table of digits or a random number generator to assign probabilities. We'll have some question of interest. Let's state it. We'll how, how we'll use a chance device, could be numbers, to imitate one repetition of the process. What are we going to record? We're going to perform many repetitions and we're going to use the results of the simulation to answer the question of interest. Um, what's the purpose of a simulation? It's to, you know, model some process that is impractical, expensive, uh, inhumane, uh, somehow not doable. Um, to estimate outcomes. Um, maybe it's an unrepeatable process. I don't know. There's something we just can't do. We can't do it again. Like the presidential election. I don't go make everybody vote like once a day to satisfy my own interests and say, oh, well, I know how everybody's going to vote because I've made everybody vote every day. You're not even, you're not polling that. You're just taking a census every day and you're deciding, okay, this one is the one we're going to actually count. That's no good, um, you know. And people, people want to know who's gonna, who do I bet on? Who's gonna win this? Who's gonna win that? Who do I need to invest? Whatever. Uh, we use simulations for these things. So let's stop and take a look at some simulations. Not inside your notes here. We need simulations sometimes because you know I can't make the Chiefs play over and over. I can't say, okay, the Chiefs, we're gonna, we're gonna make them, we're gonna make the Saints play the Panthers a thousand times. We're gonna say who wins them. Oh, we didn't make the Saints play the Panthers a hundred times and say, oh, well they won seventy six of them. Uh, this is, you know, what is this spotlight? There we go. This is based on some simulation they've done. Uh, they, they did a process over and over. Uh, they used, uh, you know, whoever's ELO numbers and said, okay, we've got this chance of scoring this many times. We perform the simulation. We run it in Madden or whatever. And this is what came out. Uh, we do the same with presidential elections. Uh, there's the economist uh, simulating uh, different uh, states' electoral outcomes. They do a you know, simulate every state as a whole part of a whole nation simulation. And we say, okay, well, we did a bunch of simulations of what we know now about uh, polling, trends, whatever. And here is what the results of our 20,000 simulations show. That's 20,000. Each of those dots is a different simulation. That's the result of 20,000 simulations. And we see, okay, given these 20,000 simulations, what we know now, if our model is any good, because remember, you know, your, 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 your model, you know, takes input from, you know, what you get in the real world. So if that input's no good, your model is going to give you crap. So you need a good model, you need good inputs, you need both of those things. If we trust those things, we see a simulation given the state of knowledge as, as it currently exists. It's going to change. So the simulation change is based on real world changes. Uh, you know, so we can do this for elections. We can do this uh, for football. We can do this for, you know, the weather. We can do this for all sorts of things. Uh, so let's jump back into the notes and do a couple simulations for things you might not want to sit and do 100,000 times. So say you wanted to simulate, I don't know, drawing Scrabble tiles from a bag, right? See, it's a thing you might want to simulate. Um, you know, because you're interested in how the game plays out or something. You want to you simulate some probabilities. Maybe you want to do some poker simulation. I don't know. You can do simulation with all sorts of types of games because human created games have well defined rules, typically, except for football. Uh, and we can assign numerical outcomes to these uh, things because they have well defined probabilities. You know, you walk in the casino, every casino game has well defined probabilities because the people that made that game, well, they seem to be making money every day. So it's as though they know. The probabilities of each outcome, they know how much money they're going to get in the long run. And, you know, so they didn't simulate that. They probably know it probabilistically with formulas, but we can do either way. So in the game of Scrabble, each player begins by drawing seven tiles from a bag containing 100. There's 42 vowels, 56 consonants, and two blanks. All right, Cat chooses her seven tiles and surprise discover all of them are vowels. We can use a simulation to see if this result is likely to happen by chance. We're interested in what's the probability of drawing seven vowels uh, we and that's a simulation might be a great thing because you don't want to sit there and pull from the bag over and over 
computer is great for this. If you, if you didn't know uh, how to find the underlying probabilities using probability formulas, a simulation is a great way to go. Um, because, well, you got, you got tiles. You got 100 tiles in a bag. How many two-digit numbers you got? Well, notice there's 100 two-digit numbers uh, if you consider double zero through 99. So we can match up tiles with number labels. Uh, so what's the idea? Oh, sorry. So state the question of interest using correct vocabulary. We've done that. What's the probability we draw seven vowels? Part B, how would we use random digits to imitate run repetition of the process? What variable would you measure? Uh, so we would say that we're going to use a random digits table. And we're going to use two digit labels. And let's say, okay, we got 42 vowels. So let's say, I don't know, like 0, 1 through 42, let's say those are vowels. Let's say 43 to 98, those are consonants. And the two weirdos, 99 and double zero, we're going to call those the blanks. Does it matter how you assign them? No. As long as there are 42 here, excuse me, 56 here and two here, you're good to go because the outcomes match up with the probabilities and reality. The outcomes in the simulation match up with the probabilities, the outcomes, the reality. Uh, what variable would you measure? We would measure um, the number of draws with all um, seven vowels. Uh, we're gonna look at, again, looking at seven labels at a time. Um, are we allowed to have repeats? Probably not, probably shouldn't, probably should have no repeats. Um, since, you know, once you pull a tile out of the bag, you don't, you don't get to pull that same tile out of the bag again. So uh, no repeats without replacement uh, with Zoom's being funky on me. Sorry, guys. Hope this still works. Cool. Without uh, replacement. So again, I hope that uh, you saw all of that. Um, use a, the line of random digits below to form, perform one repetition. Okay, you'd say, all right, 71. Let's zoom way in on this. 71, what's that? That's a consonant. 48, what's that? That's a consonant. 70, what's, oh, it's a consonant. 99, that's a blank. 84, it's a consonant. 29 is a vowel and 07 is a vowel. So we had consonant, 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 blank, consonant, vowel, vowel. Uh, so we had, you know, we had what there are two vowels, uh, but we didn't have, we certainly didn't have seven, all seven vowels. Uh, and we see, no, that was not all vowels. So how would we do that? We just keep doing that. Uh, this isn't something you do by hand. It's something you let a computer do. Computers are great for this kind of stuff, performing simulations. I've got a couple more simulations here, uh, but I think they get a little tedious. Assign numbers. Uh, and get to it. On the last one, um, she's got an 80% chance of making her three throws. I'm going to help you with the numbering scheme here. If we got an 80% chance of making our free throws, then that means 80% of labels need to go along with a make. Uh, so how could you do that? You could say, oh, well, think about that. You could use one digit labels you could say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You could say that these are makes and that these are misses. Uh, similarly, you could have used two digit labels and you could have said anything uh, like uh, zero, one through 80 was a make and 81 through 99 and double zero is a miss. Um, so whatever you do, um, the idea is that the percent of the labels you have needs to match up with the percent of a thing occurring. That's the big notion here. Uh, 
as you see, we're at the end of notes. Uh, not a not a lot more. We'll get in a fun one, 5.2 next time, talking about probability rules. Get to do Venn diagrams for here. It's just a soft introduction to uh, this idea of probability and simulation. So, hope this video works. Uh, we'll see you uh, later.